what if other Republicans at that point, including Ron DeSantis, had not gone along with Trump's defense? What if they had pushed back and said, you know, this is the moment where he needs, these are serious charges. We need to take them seriously. This party cannot nominate a convicted felon. Would that have made a difference? Because in many ways, they legitimized and normalized Trump's defense. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. I am in Wisconsin, and our guest today, Karen Tumulty from The Washington Post, is in Iowa. First of all, good morning, Karen. Good morning. So I know we were supposed to be talking about politics, but we could, do, could we talk about the weather? Because the weather seems to be kind of a factor. I don't know about you, but we're in the middle of a blizzard here, maybe 9 to 12 inches. So I'm sorry I didn't get dressed up, but but my life is going to be snow blowing for the next, I don't know, 48 hours. So what is happening in Iowa right now? I mean, what are we looking at here? Polar vortex in the middle of the Iowa caucus? Exactly. I mean, at this point, weather and politics are inseparable in Iowa. I am looking out the window of my hotel room in downtown Des Moines, where the snow is coming down at one inch an hour, and there may be more of it over the weekend. Uh, Nikki Haley has already canceled all of her events today and is going to do teletown halls. Um, Ron DeSantis, I think we're waiting for a call in a bit mm -hmm. on whether he's going to cancel. But this is this is life threatening, Charlie. Well, um, I, I do I do see here that the National Weather Service is predicting uh, the th that li life threatening cold with wind chills as low as minus 45 degrees early next week during the Iowa caucuses. So this becomes relevant. Generally, when we have a blizzard of this sort, you know, there, you know, what we call that in Wisconsin. Friday, uh, January. This does, yeah, was yeah. Saying. This this does seem to be a, you know somewhat worse than uh, than than usual, which raises okay. Let's let's deal with some cosmic questions before we get into the horse race stuff. Um, why every four years do we talk ourselves into thinking that Iowa is really really important, other than the fact that it goes first? I mean, I, I guess the reason I'm asking this is every four years we. We do a lot of heavy breathing. We spend so much time talking about the caucus stories, polling and everything. And then every four years, we find out that actually Iowa is not that important. I mean, four years ago, it was a complete fiasco. So give me some sense about the the Iowa, just the, the obsession with Iowa. The Democrats aren't even doing Iowa this year. I mean, they said, <laughs> screw that after, after what happened last year. So why, why, why do we think that Iowa is so important? Well, it is first. I mean, and, yeah. you know, and, and it's the it's the first time you have something besides a pollster telling you how the race is going. And I do think just the you very unique nature of the caucuses and the history of them is is, you know, it's it's wonderful. It's it's so, you know, I think that's what draws us back is over it? and over and over is again. It? And it is well. It's. I'm telling you, it's not at the moment. It's not the weather. Yeah. Um, and the the other thing I think that is important is it's the first test of organization that you see out of any of the cam these campaigns. But as a predictor of how the race is going to yeah. end up, it's not good. Not only at not predicting the next president, but at, at you know Barack Obama being a big exception. Yeah. Um, but it's not even good at predicting who the nominee is going to be. Yeah, I guess that's that's one of the reasons why I'm, I've always been a little bit of a, of a skeptic and we're going to see what, what's going to happen. So let, let, we're going to get to this a little bit later, you know, what, what the expectations are for next week and how that plays out going forward, you know, the the Nikki surge and, and all of that. But before we, we do that, I, I want to talk about something that I wrote about in my newsletter this morning. And I'm trying to pull back the the lens just a little bit. I find it really amazing. In the last week, two things have happened. Donald Trump has ranted and raved almost on a daily basis. And virtually every day, he tops himself on the outrageousness, whether he's talking about how he would do a better job negotiating the Civil War than Abraham Lincoln, um, his theory about magnets in water, um, dubbing the, the, the rioters who attacked the Capitol and beat up police officers as hostages, uh, going to uh, the courtroom in New York and staging that weird, bizarre temper tantrum. His lawyers 
uh, in court, and then he has endorsed this as well, essentially saying that the president should be, you know, immune from criminal prosecution, even if he ordered the assassination of political foes, if he wasn't convicted in an impeachment. So we have all of these reminders of who and what Donald Trump is and what he will do. And yet this has also been the week where it feels like all of the normie Republicans have decided they look at this and they go, yeah, he's our guy. I mean, we've seen this over the last eight years, right? The establishment caving in, but they're not even waiting for it to be a binary choice between Trump and the Democrat. They're, and, they're, and, they're going in. So give me your sense of all of it. It is just so, it, 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 look, we, you know, part of this isn't new, right? This has been the story of the last seven, eight years. But one after another, you have governors, you have senators, you have Republican, you know, congressmen who are going, yeah, I'm, I'm all in with, 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 with Donald Trump, with all of what that means. Well, and, and what I find more dispiriting, even than that he says it, because, you know, he's been saying kind of nutty stuff since right. he came down the escalator, is the fact that we have now reached the point where people not only dismiss it, they they pick it up, that language. They start using yeah. that language. Yeah. This becomes uh, almost the marching order. So you have Elise Stefanik, yeah. a member of the House Republican leadership, going on Meet the Press and using the word hostages to describe people who came in violently ripped up the Capitol, tried to steal an election, and now are facing legal consequences for it. Well, no, this is this is the extraordinary thing about it. Um, it, it. It's not just that Donald Trump says these things. It's the way that he transforms the party and the way in which he transforms the culture. Um, that that when, when, when you say that, yeah, you're, we're, you know, I'm all 100 percent behind Donald Trump, you're not just endorsing a candidate. You are also you know, really um, em embracing so many of, you know, aspects of this, uh, this, uh, this agenda. You have to look the other way about the big lie, either accept the big lie or not think it's a big deal. Um, you need to, you know, again, it's, it's this internalization of, of this. And I guess, and again, this is, this is old, but I think that we need to retain our capacity to be stunned by some of it that Republicans are not even waiting for him to lock up the nomination. I understand, I don't accept, but I understand the rationalization that when it's a binary choice, as it was in 2016, between Trump and Hillary Clinton, that you're going to go with all the crap. But, but we're eight years on. We know so much more about Donald Trump. And there are alternatives. This is not a binary choice. So, just talk to me a little bit about this dynamic that Ron DeSantis is still in the race. Okay, I mean, I I, I think it's inevitable that Trump's going to get it, but but what, why the rush to grovel? Why the rush to embrace so many things that these people know in their hearts is wrong? Um, I I just think that he killed Reaganism and has replaced it with this. And I also think that um, these candidates are not really trying to differentiate themselves from him. I mean, they act as if you, you hear Nikki Haley say, well, fair or not, chaos follows him. Yeah. And you're like, what? <laughs> it's like he has nothing to do with no. this. And, you know, to the degree I mean, they, they have both said they would pardon him. They, I, what kind of choice are they truly offering people except a, you know, a, you either get Trump or you get a continuation of Trumpism. Yeah. And I, and I, and I do think that one, just one mark of all of this though, is, and, and, and I want to talk about Chris Christie for a moment, but he really highlighted, you know, his red line where he said, talked about that moment in Milwaukee where um, all the candidates were asked, um, would you support uh, Donald Trump as the Republican nominee if he was a convicted felon? And pretty much everybody's hand went up, right? His hand, hand didn't. And, you know, Karen, I, I, I used the phrase, you know, five minutes ago, but now it's much further ago, but it doesn't seem that long ago. This would have been the easiest question in the world. No political party would have supported a convicted felon. So it's not just that they're supporting Donald Trump and all of the other baggage and everything, you know, even after Access Hollywood. They are explicitly saying that if Donald Trump shows up in Milwaukee for the Republican National Convention and accepts the nomination and he is a convicted felon and he's wearing the ankle bracelet, that they're all in for him. 
I mean, this is really, or, ama- this is a transformation of American politics and of a political party that used to be for law and order. But I think that Trump is, has decided that by, by his decision to show up in these courtrooms and to say he will continue to show up in courtrooms that, you know, it's become a campaign tool for him. Yeah. It it has become a test of loyalty for him. And I think he thinks that these prosecutions are ultimately, I mean, they will flat out tell you this going to play in his favor, that the well, new okay, narrative I, is he's, yeah. he's a victim. He's a okay, hostage. So, so I, 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 get, I get that. But why does John Barrasso buy that? Why would Chris Sununu, the governor of New Hampshire, who is not a Trump fan, why would they accept the the you know, the, yes, I'm going to support a convicted felon to be president of the United. I mean, I understand Trump's mentality at this point. I'm just trying to focus on why other people look at that and go, yeah, I'm going to go along with that. Because it keeps working for him and they are more afraid of him than they, even the critics of him are more afraid of him and his slice of the electorate then it, we are learning that mm-hmm. then they, you know, care about the, the norms of our society and our justice system and our traditions in this country. This is why, and I think you and I share this, this is why I was disappointed by Chris Christie dropping out because I look, I, I, I know all about Chris Christie's baggage. I'm going to leave that aside for a moment. I I think that his campaign, he was a mag- in the campaign, he was a magnificent beast. And he was the only guy basically standing there going, guys, are we really going to do this? Um, are we really going to go along with, uh, you know, putting this man back in the Oval Office? So give me, you, you know, I wrote a piece last week, which obviously had no influence whatsoever. I'm used to that. Um, saying, hey, hang in there, Chris. Um, and I, I think you were sort of on that bandwagon as well. You wanted him to stay. Oh, very in. much so. Yeah, yeah so, I wrote that in December as well. So give me your uh, the, thoughts about his, his decision to drop out. Here's the deal, though, for Chris Christie. I think not only had it become clear to him that um, he didn't have a path to victory here, mm-hmm. but it was also becoming clear that if Nikki Haley didn't manage to rise and become a true, you know, a a true challenge to Donald Trump, that Chris Christie was likely to get the blame for this. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he didn't want to be ultimately seen as a spoiler. Right. And it would, I personally don't think that would have been a fair characterization, but all of those people who had been telling him for months that he needs to get out would have blamed him for something that would not, at least in my opinion, have been fairly placed on him. So the the horse race punditry, obviously, I mean, the conventional wisdom here is that this benefits uh, Nikki Haley, that, um, you know, and there, were, there was some speculation that he might endorse Nikki Haley. He clearly is not, and I don't think he will endorse Nikki Haley. Oh, he, he no, uh, the, he, he is, has... Nothing but contempt for Nikki Haley. Okay, well, and that came out of that hot mic uh, episode where where he not only has contempt for her, but he thinks she's going to get smoked, that she's not up to this. And yet he still cleared the, the way for her. Um, and again, I think he was, he was more concerned about how people were going to blame. He thinks she is not up to it. But he, I think, was concerned, and I think legitimately so, that people were somehow going to blame him yeah. because he had what twelve percent or something. Yeah. He was not. He was not an insignificant factor in New Hampshire. No, and I and I think he was an important voice. I think he he played a very very important role because you know as he said, and usually what candidates say about themselves is not necessarily the truth. But I think he was right when he said he was the only candidate who was willing to tell the truth about Donald Trump. He was willing to say, you know, how, you know, talk about his 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 character and coming from Chris Christie, uh, it had to have an effect on on some folks. I mean, look, he became incredibly disliked because, as he said during that hot mic, people didn't want to hear it. But uh, it is important for people who have been around conservative politics, Republican politics like Chris Christie to say these things. So I guess the question is now, Karen, what does he do now? He said he's not going to endorse her. He um, he says he will do everything possible to prevent Donald Trump from being reelected. What what does he do now? Do you think? 
You know, I don't know where he takes this. Um, I, I would not, I mean, I can't imagine Chris Christie showing up at the Democratic convention no. and speaking. Yeah, that's um, casting. So I don't, I just honestly don't know where he takes this, except I think we're going to see a whole lot more of him on television, mm -hmm. making the case that he has been making both on television and on the debate stage. Um, but I don't see the immediate and, and he may be, you know, if Donald Trump goes down to defeat in November, I mean, Chris Christie may have a very important role in sort of trying to put together what's left of the Republican mm. party and the conservative. It's kind of burned a lot of the boats though. Um, so yeah. people like, um, Liz Cheney, and Adam Kinzinger have already sort of crossed that Rubicon and said that they would vote for Joe Biden. And if it was a binary choice. Uh, um, so, I mean, they, they've, they've created a little bit of permission, but you don't necessarily see Christie doing the same thing. I, I just, it, I find that hard to imagine because I, I, I do, do think his, he's, he still has the, you know, Republican, uh, Bonafides. What about no? What about no labels? Is he going to play uh, footsie with them? Some I sort can't, of third... I cannot imagine. I mean, that, that is just. I, I think that no labels is if they do end up putting forward a ticket is just going to do such damage to Joe Biden. Um, I, yeah. I just don't see how you can play it and you can read that any other way. So let's let's talk a little bit about Nikki Haley because as you mentioned. Um, uh, obviously, uh, obviously, Chris Christie has been watching her up close. And, you know, I, at least at the moment we wake up today and there's a Washington Post poll showing that she's moved into second place in Iowa. She's clearly surging, you know, surging with like quotation marks. Here, I'm doing the air quotes um, in in New Hampshire. Um, and, and yet Chris Christie is looking at her and going, you know, this is the unbearable lightness of, of Nikki. There's a great piece in the Atlantic by Mark Leibovich. And since you have it's, a lot of time in your hand, which was just basically. Yes, like, I read it on the plane. Yeah. It's great. Well, and he points out that, you know, she really kind of looks good. She has a good campaign. I mean, it, it, the, you know, the first, you know, your first take is that, okay, you know, this is, this is a serious person. She did well in the debate, but then he says, what exactly is she saying? Basically, if you begin really listening, there's a lot of gobbledygook there. So, you know, Chris Christie made the judgment that she is just not up to this. She's going to get smoked. What's going on there? Because she started strong. And my sense is that she hasn't carried that mo even even though she's doing well in the polls right now, that there's not as much there as we thought there was, that maybe she's not the one we've been waiting for. What do you think? Give me your take on her. Uh, I, I, you know, I read Mark Leibovich's piece and I thought it was just so on target. You do yeah. listen to how she answers a typical voter's question and you, it's just a whole bunch of kind of um, phrases put together into an, you know, easy, easy to swallow gel cap. And um, then you realize they, they don't add up to anything. The, I think she started out with all the benefits that come from being underestimated. But once you are in the hunt, once you are running second, you lose those. And people do start listening to you in a different way. And I mean, I thought her, her whole answer about the Civil War, which I think is, was a big wake up for a lot of people, mm -hmm. was not only horrifying because she didn't answer, she did, you know, she didn't mention slavery. It was horrifying to just listen to all these sort of random phrases about freedom and government. And, you know, it, it just was like, she just has a bunch of sort of phrases that roll around in yeah. and just come out. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is like this sort of this word salad that, you can tell that she's been prepped with all the talking points. So uh, did you, I don't, I, I have confessed that I did not watch either the, um, the faux uh, debate between her and DeSantis the other night or the faux town hall on, on Fox. Did you watch either one of them or both of them? I was uh, flipping back and forth okay. between the channels. And one thing it was clear to me and something that the Trump people have 
been telling me is that they here in Iowa are benefiting so much from the fact that Haley and DeSantis are attacking each other. And, well, no you know, kidding. but and and this allows Trump. I mean, his ads are have generally been I mean, he's been critical of Haley, but in general, his ads have been about taking on Biden, um, yeah, you know, on. moving on. And um, all of this has worked at least so far to his advantage. No, and and that that seems that seems pretty obvious. You know, my my takeaway, having looked at some of the highlights, though, and and this is, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this. this is kind of a random, undigested thought that as you watched, and going back to your point about the way Nikki talks in terms of these sort of pre-canned things, that watching her and DeSantis seems like looking at politicians from the before times where you look at them and you realize this is why people don't like politicians. And the contrast with Trump, who whatever you can say about him is kind of, you know, unplugged and he's unpredictable and he has moments when he's entertaining. He's not entertaining to me, but I think he's entertaining to the base. Whereas you have these two stiff, you know, radically pre-programmed politicians and you're going, same old, same old, same old. Here's the talking point. You know, press this button and you get this. As opposed to a any sort of authenticity. I guess that's, I, I hate using, you know, pre-canned words like that. But um, I just think that the, the contrast, you know, in case you were wondering why they're not making more headway against Trump, I think it was kind of on display that night. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And, you know, Haley kept talking about her her website about, you know, documenting DeSantis's lies. And that, and that would be, those of us old enough to remember how Jerry Brown would give you his 800 number in every single answer in a debate. That's, yeah. that's what that was reminding me of, you know, I've got one point here and I'm going to hammer it home no matter what the question is. By the way, that's another thing about her is that, you know, very often, um, and again, she's done, really well in the debate stage. But what you see more on the trail is um, how often the answers don't fit the questions. Yes. Well, you know, I mean, she decides she's going to answer what she wants to answer. So what do you think? Uh, and uh, again, we're, we're at the point now where what about 96 hours? I don't know how many hours are we you know, away from the, the Iowa caucus. We are. What, what are what is Ron DeSantis running for? What is Nikki Haley running for? And I especially want to start with, with Nikki Haley because one of my colleagues is speculating that she's auditioning to be VP. Um, with deep respect, I think that that's nonsense. Um, there's no way that Nikki Haley is going to be the VP. She wouldn't be saying the things she is saying now if she wanted to be VP. Trump is never going to take a chance on anyone whose loyalty is not absolutely carved in granite. If he learned one lesson from his first presidency, it is that, it is that number one, um, the vice president is the only uh, member of his cabinet he can't fire. And number two, that unless somebody is absolutely even more slavishly loyal than Mike Pence, it's risky. So there's no way that he is going to name anyone other than somebody who is smaller than him and utterly dependent on him and utterly slavishly loyal. Your your, your thoughts about the Nikki for VP uh, speculation. I, I would agree with you, everything you just said, and I would add one more thing, is that there is no way he is going to name someone who has star power of their Ex own. Exactly, right, yes. Or was any sort of independent base at all? At, at yes. All or who is capable of any sort of independent thought uh, or who might have an, a, a separate agenda. Because the moment, in theory, the moment they were to become elected, he becomes a lame duck president. And you know the vice presidency could, in theory, uh, become a power center, which is why he's gonna want somebody small and somebody dependable. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know. I can't imagine who, he would pick at this point, but it is, it is not going to be anybody. And, and by the way, you often see this even in functional white houses, uh, Clinton Gore, or if, when the vice president has their own presidential ambitions, there is tension. There is, 
you know, rivalry, there is suspicion. Um, I mean, if you take all of that and add it to the chaos you would already see in a Trump White House, uh, even even Trump would be able to figure out pretty quickly that this this, you know, would be damaging for for reasons that that go beyond, you know, Trump himself. OK, what about Elise Stefanik? She really wants uh, the job. She desperately wants to. I mean, the fact when, when her meet the press performance, I think, was a an illustration. Mr. Trump, I will say anything. I will defend anything that you say here. I will use the word hostages. I will go along with it. But is she too undependable? What do you think? Uh, she would be a pretty strong personality to have in there. And again, you would have to be wondering what she is viewing as her next move. Yeah, no, I I, I think she might be a little bit too uh, too untrustworthy. So uh, untrustworthy. So Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantis um, is not running for VP. I don't think he's got any shot at that what's whatsoever. What is he running for? Is he trying to maintain his viability for twenty twenty eight? Because that seems far more plausible to me. Yeah, I really wonder the degree to which he has, you've got to like, not be facing reality to even be in this race if, you know, if you're Ron DeSantis at this point. Um, but yeah, he's a young, he's a young man. He he must, if he, if he's smart, he's trying to figure out what his exit looks like and what kind of credibility he leaves this race with. Um, he... I went to an event for him last night. Uh, he, they were sounding, you know, they, they have put together a pretty impressive organization. He has checked every single box that you are supposed to check in the Iowa caucuses. Mm-hmm. He's been to those 99 counties. He's got the governor's endorsement. He's got the evangelical endorsement. Uh, and here he is playing by exactly, you know, what was the 2012 playbook. And it didn't get him anywhere. So, Why not? Um, why, why didn't it work? Because you make a really great point. You go down and, you know, if this was, you know, a year and a half ago, we go through, what will it take to win? What does he need to do? And he has gone through, the playbook is perfectly attuned to Iowa. So if he finishes third, what went wrong? What did he misread? What 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 was the problem there? It's that Iowa, uh, Trump has, has broken all the rules and... And by the way, the other thing that I think should not be underestimated is that this Trump operation, um, as much as it sounds like Trump himself is running off the rails more mm-hmm. often than not, he has a much more professional political operation mm-hmm. than he has ever had before. This is in really? 2016 when he and Corey Lewandowski and Hope Hicks are kind of living off the land until he gets the nomination. And this isn't 2020 when he just surrounded, he's an incumbent president and just surrounds himself with a bunch of grifters. I mean, these people have built a really impressive operation here in in Iowa. If you believe in Seltzer's polls, the they are bringing a lot more where, where he is way ahead is in first time caucus goers hmm. um, who are younger who are, are people who weren't necessarily involved in politics. And his operation has all already looking ahead. I mean, they have re-engineered the delegate selection rules in just about every state across the country in Trump's favor. So they don't, there's not a lot of backbiting in this team. There is not a lot of leaking out of this team. Um, so I, I don't know how they take this operation and then pivot it to a general election operation. But this operation has been incredibly impressive. And that, by the way, goes back to something that happened in 2016, which is that um, his operation was just a disaster to the point mm-hmm. where Ivanka Trump shows up at a caucus in Des Moines and she gets on her phone and she goes, Daddy, there's nobody here to speak for you. Mm-hmm. Nobody to stand up and give a mm-hmm. speech on his behalf. And Trump apparently brings that up constantly that that better not happen again. 
Yeah, I mean, I remember I still have the PTSD from uh, 2016, and I remember um, the Iowa caucuses where he lost to uh, uh, lost to Ted Cruz. And and you know, speaking of foreshadowing, of course, you know, he said that uh, Cruz had lied, had cheated, they wanted a do over. Um, just a reminder that Donald Trump uh, is never going to graciously concede. He is never going to acknowledge that he lost. Um, and that was on display. So going back to Ron DeSantis, though, you know, you know it's, so we have um, he's got a good campaign that didn't, you know, has not gotten any traction. Trump is doing a much better job when we all have to write our obituaries probably next week for the DeSantis campaign. You know, there's certainly obvious points. Number one, and want to get your take on this. Um, Ron DeSantis was just a bad candidate who utterly misread the Republican electorate. Um, let's start there. Well, if you look, if you look at his polling numbers, uh, cause don't forget right after the 2022 midterms, that were such a disaster where all of Trump endorsed candidates go, go down in flames yeah. with the exception of here and there, a JD Vance, mm-hmm. um, tr- actually Ron DeSantis was ahead of Trump in a number of polls. Yeah. But where where Ron DeSantis began to crater was with the first Trump indictment. Uh, All of a sudden, that fills up the airwaves and the, the, you know, that is when Trump suddenly discovers there's a political advantage in playing the victim. And DeSantis and all of these other candidates had to sort of stand behind him and support him in this. And um, that may have been the the point, even if he'd been a good candidate, which he was not, that I think was the point of no return for him. Well, okay. This we'll, we'll never know whether, what, what would actually have happened, but, but what if other Republicans at that point, including Ron DeSantis had not gone along with Trump's defense? What if they had pushed back and said, you know, this is the moment where he needs, these are serious charges. We need to take them seriously. This party cannot nominate a convicted felon. Would that have made a difference? Because in many ways, they legitimized and normalized Trump's defense, didn't they? So if it had gone the other way, would it have made a difference? Would it have have worked? I think at a minimum, maybe if he had he and the other ones would have, who were not named Chris Christie mm-hmm. would have said, you know, we've, we've got to let the, the legal process play out here. Yeah. You know, we've got to withhold judgment as opposed to, um, you know, I mean, the fact that Trump turned his mugshot into, you know, a big money raiser for the campaign. The, the other thing, too, was if you just look in, again at blocking and tackling, um, I, I think it was a strategic mistake for uh, DeSantis to turn over so much of his operation to a super PAC. Yeah. It was a strategic mistake the way he spent money. I mean, he was hemorrhaging money on things like private jets. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he, he made a lot of mistakes. He is not the most appealing candidate, No, but I do, I do think that there was probably no way for him to dig out once Trump got indicted. Well, especially the way that he and other Republicans handled all of that. And again, we, we, will never, we will never know. The other thing about Ron DeSantis is that Ron DeSantis was under the impression that, that if he took the, um, if he moved to the right on policy issues, uh, that he could nail down the MAGA base, that he could be, you know, Trumpism without Trump. When in fact, um, I think that was also a miscalculation. Because what Republican voters wanted was they wanted the fights, they wanted Trump, they wanted the show, and Ron DeSantis was giving them maybe what they what they wanted, but he was dull as shit. And well, I don't know how he's going to yeah. win over win win over this I, base that they wanted more Trump. Well, I, last night, I think he must have gone on about DEI for about five minutes. Yeah. And we were, you know, we're, we're coming up on 10 o'clock on a weeknight and it's, uh, you know, almost an hour into he's been speaking. And um, yeah, I, I don't think that, the, yeah, there isn't much of a show to this. Plus, there's also, it's not only the show that the Trump base likes. I think they find in each other a kind of sense of community that somehow Trump has managed to create. 
okay, I, I, I stumbled across something that I had not seen before. I don't know whether you, 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 you probably are more clued in than I am on all of this, but I, I can't believe that I never knew that there was such a thing as MAGA romance novels. Have you ever uh, seen no. these? No, my oh. book club hadn't hadn't read any of those. Oh, okay, yet. I'll I will I will send you something about this. The, you know, when you talk about a sense of unity, whatever you think, it's way worse than you thought. Okay, so let's do a little uh, let's do a little horse race punditry on on Iowa. Um, let's go back to where we started. The weather, um, the weather is going to be a factor because you have to show up. You have to show up in person. You have to get in your car. You have to go someplace. You have to go into some ill lit basement of a bar and stand around. If it's minus forty five and there's you know all of this snow, that's going to have an effect. Who benefits? Who's hurt? How do you think this will affect the outcome of the Iowa caucus? Well, and by the way, you often have to drag your kids out into that. Um, but they, I think uh, there, there are two schools of thought on this. One is that the MAGA base is the most dedicated. They are the most do or die. Uh, they'll show up no matter what. The other one is there are going to be enough people out there going, the guy's at 30 points ahead in the polls. He doesn't need me. I'll, right. I'll watch it at home. Yeah. Um, my gut's telling me it's the former. I think they'll show up. Um, and I think they're excited in a way that maybe the other candidates' bases are. I mean, they've been attached to him for longer. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, there's there's two ways of looking at these results, of course. Number one is just the raw numbers, who wins, who loses. But, of course, that's not the way things really play out. There's also the expectation game. How does the expectation game play out, do you think, Karen? Um, I agree. Uh, yeah. Who comes in second versus who comes in third is is certainly going to be, you know, talked about. But Trump is running against Trump's expectations. And right now, I think the over under is 50 percent, which is incredibly high. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest margin that any candidate has ever had in a contested Republican caucus was Bob Dole in 1996. And it mm -hmm. was 12 percentage points and change. You know, Trump is 30 percentage points in all these polls going in. So even if he like busts every historical record, he's also going to be running against the, his own poll numbers and showing that those poll numbers are actually real. Well, I mean, and, and also the, you know, we, we've, we've seen this before. So what's the headline? You know, tr Trump wins, but if Nikki Haley comes within 20 points, does she become the story? I mean, can yes, you become I the story even though you lose pretty badly? If, if he gets somewhere in, say, the low 40s, oh. yeah, Nikki, Nikki Haley or whoever's number two, uh, we haven't mentioned Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, anyway, but whoever's number two, uh, that that is going to become the more powerful narrative, I think, going into New Hampshire. And she needs that. OK, sh should we mention Vivek? Because I, I kind of no, make an effort no, I not was to ever mention him. What? No. So what? Wait, he's still in the race. He's still like, what? What? What happened there? Where? Where's he going? He's I, he's still having events. I, I must admit, I haven't made it to any of them yet. And, you know, it's snowing. <laughs> Okay, I, I think we spent enough time on 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 Vivek. Okay, so um, before before we wrap up, meanwhile, uh, back in Washington, um, the Republican congressional meltdown continues. I mean, this is just like, oh my God, the scriptwriters would have you know that we're in, we're in season two of all of this, and you have um, the, the the new fifth fifth string speaker hanging on by a thread, um, the right wing Freedom Caucus in revolt again against him. Um, everybody's scrambling to prevent a government shutdown. Do you think we're going to have a government shutdown because Mike Johnson can't control his own caucus? What do you think? What happens next week? Uh, I think in the end, the Democrats are going to have to come up with the votes Yeah. again. Okay. Then, then does Johnson survive that? Because that's what killed Kevin McCarthy, wasn't it? Yeah. And I, I just don't, I, as much as the, they love to like, rattle their swords. Do they really want to go through another three weeks of, you know, of this? And then they end up, you know, they're going to have to go to Chad, the intern. 
Yeah, Chad the intern. We're, we're, we're very, very close to Chad the intern. Um, but when you say, do they want to go through this? It only takes five or six of them. Actually, it only takes three these days, right? I mean, if, right. uh, if you know, frankly, you know, half a dozen of them want to go through this, they'll go through this, right? I mean, but how, how badly know. do they want that? We're in an election year now. Um, and we're not dealing with majority, rational actors all the that's time. True, that's we? true. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but. Well, I mean, but it, it does feel like we are going through the same sort of same old, same old. And, you know, this is how the this is how the McCarthy speakership came to uh, to an end. This was the beginning. You vote down a rule. They're starting to vote down rules. They're yelling at each other, screaming at each other on the House floor. And what is the margin now? Is it is it two votes? Is it one vote? Is it three votes? I mean, when we say I, that Mike Johnson is hanging by I a thread, it's three. Yeah. You know. Exactly. And, you know, we're one person slipping on the ice and breaking yeah. a leg or something away from. Yeah, you, know. you have what you have, you have one one congressman who eats bad fish and you have Speaker Hakeem Jeffries. I mean, it's just it, it, it feel it feels that that tenuous. And we're laughing about this. Uh, unfortunately, there are you know big things at stake, including whether or not we're going to ever pass that Ukraine bill, wherever we're going to be able to do anything about the border whether or not we're going to give aid to Israel, all of that stuff. And meanwhile, the theater of Hunter Biden was the most dramatic moment in on Capitol Hill, wasn't it? Yeah. And that that one, I'm, but apparently that came as a surprise to a lot of people at the White House, too. Um, I, I don't know that this was necessarily the the best move on on Hunter's part. Oh, I see. I agree with you. I was listening to a, um, a legal analyst uh, yesterday saying that, he, you know, that um, first of all, they, they didn't give dad a heads up that he was doing it, and which is probably prudent because you want to preserve deniability. Um, and that, you know, by showing up, uh, Hunter made it less likely he would be held, you know, charged with, you know, contempt of Congress for not, you know, going into the, the, the closed session. But I tend to agree with you. It's a, I don't see that Hunter Biden is a particularly um, useful asset for uh, the Democrats or for Biden. I mean, there's a little bit of theater there. I thought Republicans are behaving badly, but um, the less Hunter Biden, the better. At least that's my take on it. Yeah, I think so too, especially since there's such an imperative now for, you know, for people to be focusing on Biden and, what he wants to present to the public as what he has achieved as, you know, that he's on top of the three or four gigantic international crises going on. Uh, There's just so much else he wants, he wants to and needs to be talking about right now. No, completely agree. Karen Tumulty, thank you so much for joining me. Karen Tumulty is the associate editor and columnist for the Washington Post joining us from frigid frozen Iowa. Try to stay warm this weekend, Karen. Oh, you too, with you and your snowblower. My only concern is whether or not my snowblower is big enough to handle this. I have a pretty big snowblower, but when you get to 9 to 12 inches, eh, it becomes a little <laughs> problematic. We'll, we'll, we'll let people know on, on Monday how, how that works out. And thank you all for listening to this Weekend Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday, and we'll do this all over again.